Hey there, art nerds. So this is a time-lapsed version of a workshop that I hosted here on the channel using alcohol markers. So this has been condensed for your viewing pleasure, but you guys can check out the full alcohol marker workshop. So today I'm going to show you guys how to render a Christmas candle using alcohol markers. There's going to be a line art link down in the description below. You can purchase it if you'd like to color along. I'm going to ink this first using Tombow Furenosuke brush pens. I've talked about these quite a bit and I even mentioned them in my 2020 recommended art supplies. So if you're on the market for some great art supplies, maybe you're receiving a gift card for Christmas. I hope you guys will check that list out. I think I've got a lot of stuff that you guys may not have heard of or that you might be interested in trying out. So these are brush pens. They've got kind of a stiff not super flexible brush tip, but I really like them because they're capable of really thin lines, really thick lines, but also they are alcohol marker safe and waterproof, which is a big deal for traditional media artists like me. So I'm doing a colored line art technique and this requires you figuring out what colors you want everything to be before you marker it. So just off screen, I may have even shown it in screen, I have a post-it note where I have the basic colors for everything kind of figured out in advance. And I'm using most of the Tombow Furunosuke range. I'm also using a black Sakura Pigma for just the black areas here. So this Christmas candle was inspired by my own childhood Christmases, both going to church and watching them light the Advent candles, but also I really remember my grandmother having this big red candle and I just remember her lighting it at Christmas. I don't think it's specifically a Christmas candle, but I remember playing in the wax and burning myself like a, like a very smart person. So um, I just kind of inspired this here. So this year we don't have any fresh Christmas greenery in the house since we are renting and we both have allergies. But uh, next year I'd really like to either have a real Christmas tree or at least some real garlands up in the tree. So for the colored line art, uh, like I said, you wanna determine the colors everything's going to be beforehand. And then you're gonna basically boil it down to two at most three colors. So in this illustration, I'm pretty much just working with the main local color, the main color of the object, and then the shadow color. And if you're having trouble kind of picking stuff that works, an easy way to go is like, okay, so if yellow is your local color, you might wanna shade that with orange or red. And by shade, I mean you're inking the area that's moving away from the light source with those darker colors. With blue, you might wanna shade it with purple. With green, you might wanna shade it with blue. With red, you might wanna shade it with purple. With purple, you might wanna shade it with black. So as you can see, we're generally moving cooler and darker as we go. Of course, you could add some real interest by inking the, um, the shadow color with like a contrast or a complementary color that kind of stands out. So like pink and teal would be a really good example for that. And that would be something that would be really fun to try in the future. So maybe you'll see me do that at some point. <laughs> so inking with colored inks is really great because when you ink with black, you're adding a lot of contrast and that can have a, a tendency to kind of deaden the piece. If you're inking with colored inks, then you're, you are still adding contrast, but not as much contrast. And you can really use it to highlight the art rather than to just line the art. So it becomes part of the color and part of the artwork itself, rather than just the thing you defined the lines with. So once I finished this piece, I allowed the line art to dry for 24 hours and then I erased the pencils underneath and scanned it. And like I said, down in the description below, you can purchase either the, well, actually the Gumroad link is for both the colored version of this line art. So you can color a colored line art or a black and white one for my traditionalist friends. 
Now, when it comes to alcohol markers, unless I'm doing something, unless I'm doing something brand specific, I basically just grab whatever colors and whatever brands I happen to like. So this piece is going to use Prismacolors, Copic markers, and Blick Studio Brush markers primarily. The colors I'm using are PB24, which is a Prismacolor color, 095, which is a Blick color. E00, which is a Copic color, E34, which is a Copic color, and PB78, which is a Copic color, and I mean a Prismacolor color, and those are going to be used for the candle itself, since it's a, um, I wanted it to be kind of a cream colored candle. For the halo around the candle, I'm using PB23 and PB131. Those are both Prismacolor colors. For the flame or the corona, I'm using PB18. PB17 and PB19, those are all Prismacolor colors. PB15 and PB14, as well as PB6, again, Prismacolor colors. For the golden balls, I'm using PB23, PB131, PB18, and E08. So the first three of those are Prismacolor colors, and the last one is a Copic color. For the pine cones, I'm using PB90, PB113, and PB 214, most of those are Prismacolor colors. And then for the greenery, I'm using G24, G94, PB31, and PB45. So to create a clean border, I'm applying a mask, and it's just like post-it note tape. You can use masking tape, you can use washi tape, you can use any low-tack, easy-to-remove ta tape just to kind of create a border. And I'm feathering in my lightest of the yellows, my PB23, so it's a Prismacolor brush color. And I'm kind of leaving a halo of white around the flame itself. I'm going to blend that out using the Colorless Blender. And then I'm going to go back in with the PB23, adding another layer, kind of feathering it into the prior layer. This is going to help eliminate streaks, and it's also going to build up some of the colors. So most alcohol markers, you can get three layers of color out of them, especially if you're working with darker, or I'm sorry, heavier papers like this. Today I'm working on Strathmore 300 Series Smooth Bristol. So into that PB23, I'm blending in some PB131. It's a slightly darker yellow. And one of the reasons I'm using Prismacolor markers today is because Prismacolor makes some really good yellows and purples. And since I'm rendering a candle for you guys, it was really important to me that I get those good yellows. So next I'm going to start working on the corona or the the area kind of radiating around the, the candle. So I wanted to do alternating yellow and orange areas. So I'm starting with PB19, which is a really just solid yellow from Prismacolor. And I'm doing a similar feather technique that I did with the corona. And once I've done two layers of PB19, I'm feathering in some PB18, which is just slightly darker. And what I want is a really smooth transition in color. And I really want it to be much lighter as it approaches the corona of light. So I'm going to do all of the yellow spaces. So remember, I want to alternate yellow and orange for this. This is kind of a retro-inspired illustration. So very 70s kind of missalette inspired, which is funny because the missalettes even now in 2020 are using the same illustrations that they commissioned in the 70s. Um, I'm going to use the, I'm going to use alternating yellow and orange to render our Corona. So I'm going to finish rendering all of the yellow and then I'm going to start doing the orange.
Now I decided I wanted a little bit more intensity of color towards the edges of the yellow radiating lines. So I'm going in with a little bit of PB17, which is a little bit more orange than our PB18, and just kind of blending that back a little bit. So now I'm gonna do the orange radiating lines, and for that I'm using PB15, PB14, and PB6, so all Prismacolor colors. Did I mention Prismacolor also makes some really good oranges? I really feel like Prismacolor is underrated considering what it can do. It's not perfect. You, it's not refillable. You can't replace the brushes. It's owned by Newell Rubbermaid. They don't respond to emails, but the markers themselves are still pretty solid. So I'm using a similar technique to what I use for the yellow radiating lines where we start with our PB17. We do a couple of layers of that kind of feathering towards the corona or that highlight, that halo of yellow around the candle light or the candle flame. Then I'm going in with PB14. So this is a redder, darker orange. And then finally, I'm gonna go in with PB6 around the edges, kind of around the border. And you guys can see why I masked this off. It's gonna give us a straight line. Even if your alcohol markers saturate your tape, like this tape is a porous tape and markers will saturate through it. It does give you an idea of where you might wanna apply your white out or your bleed proof white or your white gouache to clean it up if you wanted to clean it up. So I'm going to use the same technique all the way around the candle. Now that the background itself has been colored in, I wanna start coloring the candle's flame. So I've selected um, a, a yellow, an orange, and a very red. So I have PB19, I have PB14, and I believe I have PB6 here. And I use the yellow for the exterior of the flame and the red for the interior, and usually, um, when you start seeing reds in a candle flame, it usually means that the flame is burning cooler. So like the, the lighter the color, like we go from red to orange to yellow and then to blue, that's increasing in heat. But this is just an illustration and I'm really focusing more on what works for this illustration. So to create the impression of light hitting the candle, yellow warm candle light, I applied some PB23. That's the first color we used in the halo around the candle or the cast candle light, I guess we could call it. And then I'm blending this color out a bit with the colorless blender. Um, I'm also applying a layer of our very first candle color, which would be PB24. 
which was a or which is a really light almost skin toning color and then I'm going in with PB78 so this is a much darker color and I'm using this to render the cast shadows or the shadows that are being cast from the wax drips and I'm also trying to create a coarse shadow at the center of the candle I'm blending that back out a bit with our PB24 And while that dries, I'm going to start working on the golden balls. So I'm starting with PB23, that's our really light yellow buttery color. And then I'm going to use PB131, which is a richer yellow that's not too, too much darker and it's not too saturated. So when we're going for golden, I'm not thinking like bright brassy yellow. I'm thinking of kind of a warmer, uh, more mellow sort of gold. Next, I'm using PB18 to draw in some of the shadows on our golden ornaments or our golden balls. So keep in mind that they're kind of spherical. Then I'm going to switch back over to the candle. And it's hard to tell what color I'm using. I'm so sorry about that. But I think I'm using PB78 to add another layer to our shadows and develop our shadows now that the first layer of PB78 has had a chance to dry. Then for our darkest shadows on our golden balls, I'm using E08, which is a Copic color. And you guys will see me touch the illustration. That's to see if the paper's still cool. If the paper's still cool, then the alcohol ink inside is still wet. And you can get some really nice soft blends with that. But if you're trying to do like crisp delineations, like you might get in a metallic reflection, like in golden balls like these, then you want the paper to be drier so that you're going to get those sharper lines. So for the pine cones, I'm putting down a layer of PB90, which is a really sort of warm, rich, cocoa-esque brown. And then once that dries, I'm going over it again with the same brown. Remember, you can usually get three tones of color if you allow the first layer to kind of evaporate. And then for the darker shadows on the candle, I'm using Copic E34 to do some of the darkest cast shadows. Now I'm not using any complementary colors or contrasting colors here to do my shadows. That's a trick I do use sometimes, but I have a tendency to go overboard and over desaturate what I'm doing. So I'm mostly keeping it to local color shadows. So once the pine cones had a chance to dry, I'm going in with PB213. So it's a darker brown and I'm leaving kind of the little, the edges of the pine cones, I'm leaving those the original PB90. And I'm also going to start trying to work in the cylindrical form or rather the conical form that pine cones tend to have. And I'm going to do that by leaving the top part of the pine cone less rendered and then adding more shadow as we work our way to the bottom. But for now, I'm mostly just leaving those little crescents on the pine cones uncolored and coloring in the rest with PB213. Once that had a chance to dry, I'm going in with PB214, which is a really dark brown, to start adding in more of those shadows. And even though I do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of watercolor stuff here on the channel, I really do love working with alcohol markers. And I'm trying to make it a point towards the end of 2020 and as we go into 2021 to start working with alcohol markers more because they're very fast, immediate media. I don't have to wait for them to dry nearly as long as I have to wait for Copics, or I'm sorry, for watercolor to dry. And here in Louisiana, this is an easier media to work with in a lot of ways. I've also kind of fallen in love with doing larger marker pieces. Usually I do really small things, but larger marker pieces actually give me a lot of room to do blending and to create shadows. So when my first layer of PB214 dried, I went in with another layer. So building up that tone and I mostly left the top part of the pine cone on minus that layer. I really focused more as we kind of progress 
towards the bottom of the sphere. I'm also using that same color to draw the stems in on the branches. So I'm starting the branches with G24, a really light green from Copic. And I do want to admit that I kind of got away from myself with these branches. I had kind of a strong idea in my head, but chatting with the chat, I kind of let myself get a little bit distracted from what I was doing. So unfortunately, that's just an ADHD person problem sometimes. And um, I'm just mentioning it because generally I want to keep my lighter, brighter, more saturated colors towards the top of the branches, closer to where the light source is, and then keep my darker, bluer colors either as we're moving away from the candle and away from the viewer, or as we're moving towards the bottom of the branches. And that's just a better way to kind of balance the contrast in the shadow. So I'm using kind of a... Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see and I apologize. I'm doing just a bunch of really small short strokes that look like pine needles. Next I'm going in with G24 and I really should have left, I mean G94 is my second layer. I really should have left more of G24, the lighter color visible. I ended up over rendering with the G94 and not leaving enough of that initial color still visible. Now I'm adding in a layer of PB31, so Prismacolor color, and you guys can kind of start to see what I'm saying where I kind of got away from myself and I didn't practice enough discipline and kind of stop myself from over rendering the piece and adding too many of the same colors towards the foreground. I really should have left more of the lighter colors towards the foreground. You can also see the sort of needle-like strokes that I'm using here a little bit better. So at this point I kind of realized my mistake and I'm trying to resolve it and make it work with mixed success. And going back in with some of the other colors, trying to lighten some areas, trying to darken some colors. As you guys can see, everything's kind of the same value here. And I didn't really do as good a job with the greenery as I did with, say, the golden balls or the candle or the pine cones in establishing and creating value. To really add in some shadow and some dimension to these leaves, I'm using PB45, which is like a navy blue, to shade in our pine needles. And you want to use this kind of sparingly, especially to, if you're using it at the top of the branches, because it's the shadow color. You really want to kind of reserve it for areas that are blocked by the light or areas that are underneath things.
So at this point, I'm just kind of trying to tweak the color balance and bring more depth into this piece, bring more dimension into the piece. So I'm just kind of working through our G94, our PB31, and our PB45, trying to bring good balance to our fur needles. So at this point, I'm basically done with the alcohol markers, but I'm not done with this piece. I'm gonna use some white gouache to bring in highlights and to clean things up quite a bit. I like that you can see the paint puck pretty clearly in my cup of clean water. So I talk about this thing all the time. I love it. It is great for scrubbing out excess pigment from your brush so that you get a cleaner brush when you're mixing colors and your colors are less likely to be muddy. These things are great. I talked about them in the 2018 gift guide and I hope everybody finds them and tries them out because I highly recommend them. So I'm using white gouache to kind of clean up the lines around the halo and the corona around the candle. So you guys can see I've done a white line around the halo or like kind of, I don't know, the, the glow of light around the candle. And then I'm going to clean up the lines between the radiating yellow and orange. And boy, I really managed to capture the glow effect on this one. So I'm pretty pleased with my feathering here. Speaking of, if you're interested in more tutorials on glow effects in alcohol markers, I've got a great tutorial from Halloween where I show you all sorts of different techniques to create really nice glow effects. So I hope you guys will check that one out. I've also got some more Christmas and holiday inspired alcohol marker tutorials here on the channel that I hope you guys will enjoy, including a really, really cute one coming up soon. So I'm also using the white gouache to add some white highlights to the fur needles. Again, still trying to fix that contrast, still trying to adjust the light balance so that it actually looks right. I'm also adding some white highlights to the golden balls and I'm using like a little circular highlight for that as well. I think those are called specular highlights. And I'm gonna add some white highlights on the pine cones as well. Uh, that's not necessarily all that realistic. You can pretend it's lichen if that helps, but it looks good and art is a lot about what looks good. So once the white gouache dried, it's time to remove our borders. What I like about this kind of post-it note tape is it's really easy to remove and it doesn't tear the paper underneath. And it did a pretty good job of blocking the alcohol marker here. So it didn't soak through too bad. There's really not much cleanup to do. And um, it actually created this really soft sort of feathering effect, which I kind of like given the subject matter. So 
I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial on how to color a Christmas candle using alcohol markers. I really enjoyed the live stream and I have more ideas for live streams in the future so I hope you guys will join me. I hope you guys have a safe, happy, and warm holiday season and I hope to see you guys again soon. Bye guys!